Hey there, everybody. This is your host, Michelle Ann Olson, and you are listening to Are You Afraid of the Bark, the podcast that goes bark in the night. Welcome, dear listeners, to episode 13 of the podcast. I'm really looking forward to this episode. It's a topic that was very, very interesting to research. Interesting and a little bit sad, but a topic that I think is very timely, given that we celebrated Remembrance Day here in Canada this Sunday, November 11th. Remembrance Day, of course, is the day when Canadians remember the men and women who have died in all conflicts and peacekeeping missions over the course of our history. And over the past few years, I've seen on Remembrance Day more and more attention being paid to the animals who also lost their lives over the course of our military history. Everything from horses to dogs to cats to pigeons. And that's the topic that we're going to be exploring in this week's episode. It's my own sort of, my own sort of personal thank you to the men, women, and animals who have lost their lives in the name of this country that I love so much. So yes, obviously the topic makes me a little bit emotional, but please also be aware that my voice continues to come and go these days. That's just... What happens when you get the world's worst case of laryngitis and are simultaneously teaching little monsters in the form of children in a classroom every day? So please excuse the quality of my voice, and I really hope that despite it, I can get across to you how much it meant for me to research this topic and how important I think it is to share these stories, especially this week. So sit back, relax, and let's talk about animals in conflict, animals at war. They were important across the world, but with a focus today on those who gave their lives for Canada. Since we just celebrated on Sunday 100 years since the end of the Great War, that is to say World War I, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the use of animals during that conflict, the Great War of 1914 to 1918. So at the start of that war, the use of animals was considered similar to the use of equipment and supplies. These animals were not seeing necessarily as living beings, as having the value of a living being in the same way that soldiers had value. They were more on par with helmets and boots and weaponry. They were really equipment to be used in support of the Allied and the Canadian cause. So horses, of course, played a huge role in World War I. They were initially used in the form of cavalry, but over the course of World War I, we saw, of course, the shift toward trench warfare and so cavalry were no longer effective. But horses were still essential to move equipment to the front lines, and they were a major mode of transportation on the European stage. It's worth noting that during the First World War, 8 million horses were killed, and 2.5 million were injured as they transported soldiers and supplies to battlefields. These horses were taken from the wild a lot of the time, from plains in the United States and Canada, as well as directly from the fields and factories in Britain. And from there, they would have been shipped off to places unfamiliar, very dirty, and probably very frightening. I have here a quote from a man named Lloyd Swick. So he's a war veteran and the founder of the Animals in War Dedication Project. And this is what he has to say about the use of horses in World War I. Quote, The First World War was fought in muck and crud, in conditions where trucks were useless. Any movement would have had to have come from the pulling power of our horses. End quote. So the heavier draught horses pulled larger artillery, and 
were eventually phased out and replaced by motor vehicles as itinerary like tanks became heavier and heavier, while lighter grade horses were used in the transportation of personnel. So Swick mentions in this interview that I read, he's quick to point out that a lot of horses were left in the care of those who didn't know how to tend to them or who didn't necessarily want to be tending to them. There was a big shortage of hay, a lot of it having been trampled into the mud, and many horses starved. Shelter was scarce, and where it was available, it was obviously prioritized for use by the soldiers, and a lot of animals were left out to endure all kinds of weather. So Swick's own father-in-law served with the Royal Canadian Army Veterinary Corps, which I didn't even know was a thing, but which sounds like an incredible way to use that skill set on behalf of your country. Anyway, Swick's father-in-law served with the Royal Canadian Army Veterinary Corps, and he recalled later in his life having great difficulty trying to calm down war animals who were struck by trauma, and he described the looks in their eyes as that of absolute fear. So... It's hard to, hard to fathom. It is easier to fathom the fear felt by a young soldier. Harder to imagine how confusing it must have been to an animal to be on the front lines, to be on the battlefield with all of its sights and sounds and smells. Anyway, it's, it's really sad. So in addition to horses, another animal that was greatly relied on were pigeons, and they were a form of communication from the front line to headquarters at the rear of battlegrounds. They were, like I said, a reliable form of communication valued for this impeccable homing instinct that we associate with pigeons, as well as their speed, which made it very difficult for even marksmen to shoot them down. What's interesting is that during this time, the killing, wounding, or molesting of a homing pigeon was punishable by law, with sentences ranging from a 100-pound fine to six months imprisonment. So the biggest threat to pigeons was not a soldier's marksmanship, but later in the war, the introduction of birds of prey, such as falcons, to the European sphere. <laughs> All I can think of is that's how you get invasive species. Dogs and cats were also important during the conflict. They were fitted with gas masks and parachuted behind enemy lines. Dogs, in particular, would detect dangerous gases, explosives, and landmines and were known to rescue soldiers and civilians alike. They carried messages over the battlefields with totes around their neck, but perhaps most importantly, their presence normalized the war environment for troops and helped to boost their morale. To have the normalcy of a pet dog or cat, they were kept as mascots and pets, and cats were especially useful in the trenches because, of course, where a cat was present, the proliferation of rodents, of pests, was greatly reduced. So it's important that we note that by the end of the First World War, the, this was really the, the, the birth of an animal rights sentiment. So military personnel, especially veterinarians and horse drivers, began to encourage fellow soldiers to treat war animals humanely. And for so many of the soldiers, an animal companion eased the burden of suffering in the trenches. These were sources of comfort and friendship for exhausted and lonely soldiers. One more general thing that I wanted to mention was the apparent, I had no idea about this, the apparent use of glow worms in the First World War. In the dark, soldiers used the soft lights of glow worms to read maps and messages, as well as letters from home, without being detected by the enemy. That's so fantastic. It's like a sustainable undercover light source. I love it. Why don't they tell us this kind of thing in history class? I always think that it's those details that really bring home what these conflicts must have been like, how absurd they must have seemed at times. I'm a big believer, apologies for the quick tangent, but as a tour guide for the Haunted Walk for so many years, people said that the stories that we told about Ottawa's haunted history about its somewhat scandalous early political history, really humanizing its history 
cause people to see their city and its history in a whole new light. So it's those kinds of human details, or in this case, even animal details, that brings a history alive. And I think that classrooms could really benefit from those kinds of details. That's the kind of thing that as a kid, I would take home with me and that would really help me to imagine a soldier in the dark of a trench reading a letter from home by the light of a glow warm, you know, being afraid of detection or bombing from overhead. Now I'd like to share with you a particular story of a particular dog, a Canadian dog who served in not the First World War, but the Second World War. His name was Sergeant Gander, and he was a Newfoundland dog. He started his life under the name of Pal, and he belonged to a Hayden family who lived in Gander, Newfoundland. In the 1940s, he loved to play with the neighborhood children, and he was often used as a sled dog. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with Newfoundland dogs, but they are great big beasts of dogs. They have an excellent temperament, but they are massive. And interesting side fact, they actually have webs between the toes of their paws that makes them excellent swimmers. And they've been known to save more than one life from from drowning on the East Coast. So big dogs... Gander was apparently about 130 pounds. So unfortunately, in the 1940s, while playing with the neighborhood kids, Pal accidentally scratched the face of a six-year-old. And because a doctor was required to stitch closed that scratch, the Hayden family was faced with the decision of having to either put Pal down or give him away. So luckily for Pal, and luckily for everybody involved, they gave him to the soldiers stationed at a nearby air base, the Royal Canadian Air Force Station in Gander. And there he was, renamed Gander, and he became the regimental mascot for the 1st Battalion of the Royal Rifles of Canada. In 1941, the 1st Battalion were sent to Hong Kong to fight against invading Japanese. And rather than leave Gander behind, they promoted him to the rank of sergeant so that he could join the soldiers on their mission. A rifleman named Fred Kelly was responsible for caring for Gander, and apparently while he was in Hong Kong, Kelly would let Gander take long, cold showers to deal with the immense heat. And I can only imagine what that was like, given the Newfoundland dog's thick, heavy coat. So according to rifleman Kelly, Gander was also a fan of beer. The Battle of Hong Kong began on December 8, 1941, and on three separate occasions, Gander helped fight Japanese invaders. He charged at Japanese soldiers who made the mistake of getting too close to Canadian troops, and he tackled them. He growled, he ran at enemy soldiers, he bit at their heels. Many of these battles took place at night, and due to his black fur, Gander was hard to see. Therefore, instead of being able to shoot him, Japanese troops would often just run away in order to escape Gander's wrath. As an interesting side note, later Canadian prisoners of war were interrogated by the Japanese about a so-called black beast who was likely Gander because they feared that the Allies were somehow training ferocious mythical animals for warfare. On December 19th, after midnight, the Battle of Lai Moon broke out. So Gander fought off the Japanese as he always did, until a grenade was thrown near a group of injured soldiers, injured Canadian soldiers. Somehow knowing what was about to happen, Gander picked up the grenade with his mouth and he ran off. The grenade exploded and Gander was killed, but he saved the lives of those seven soldiers. Sixty years later, He was posthumously awarded the Dickin Medal for Gallantry by the People's Dispensary for Sick Animals, which was essentially a Victoria Cross for animals. It had not been awarded since 1949. The ceremony took place in October of 2000, and it was attended by 20 surviving members of Gander's regiment, including Fred Kelly, who had a new Newfoundland dog at his side and who accepted the medal on Gander's behalf. For all of my Ottawa friends listening in, You can visit that medal on display at the Canadian War Museum in Ottawa. And I wish that I had known that story the last time I was there, because I would love to see it. If you're at the War Museum in the next little while, take a picture and send it to me. I'd love to see it. 
Gander's name is also listed alongside the 1,977 Canadians who died during the Battle of Hong Kong on the Hong Kong Veterans Memorial Wall. So let's turn now to some more bizarre stories of animal involvement in conflict. These stories are not necessarily Canadian. They're just mostly odd about animals that I don't associate with wartime efforts at all. The first animal I'd like to mention is Tirpitz, who is a pig, or was a pig. Tirpitz was the mascot of the HMS Glasgow during the First World War. So the pig was originally kept on board a German cruiser, the SMS Dresden, which sank in 1915. Tirpitz was abandoned with the ship as it sank, but somehow managed to escape and swim away from the sinking vessel. She was spotted by the crew of the HMS Glasgow. One of the soldiers jumped in to rescue her and nearly drowned in the process. So the crew awarded Tirpitz a fake iron cross, which is a German military honor for remaining on board the sinking Dresden after the rest of her cowardly crew had left it. She served as the mascot on the Glasgow until 1916, when she retired to the Whale Island Gunnery School near Portsmouth. I don't know how I feel about this end to her life, but she was eventually auctioned off for pork in 1919, raising 1,785 pounds for the British Red Cross. Her head was mounted and given to the Imperial War Museum in London, where it remains on display to this day. Good on you, Seer Pets, for out surviving that first sinking of the Dresden. But it's kind of an unceremonious ending for a much beloved mascot, in my opinion. Secondly, I wanted to talk about Wajtek, who was a soldier bear and the mascot of the 22nd Transport Artillery Supply Company, Polish II Corps, in the Second World War. He was a Syrian brown bear adopted as a cub by Polish troops as they were passing through Iran on their way to a posting in the Middle East. Wajtek means little one but he weighed about 250 pounds and grew to over six feet tall. He was tame and got along well in human company. He would wrestle and play fight with the men and, like Gander, apparently enjoyed the taste of beer. In 1943, his unit was posted to Italy and Washtek was enlisted so he could accompany them. He was assigned a service number and given the rank of private. During fighting for Monte Cassino, Washtek helped keep frontline troops supplied carrying heavy shells and boxes of ammunition, and the image of him carrying shells was later incorporated into the company's insignia. After the war, Washtek traveled with the unit to Scotland, where he found a home at Edinburgh Zoo until his death in 1963. So thank goodness he, there was a much a much more dignified ending to his story than to poor Tirpetz's. And that is what I have to say on the topic of animals in conflict, animals in war. Just some some sweet and some sad and some thoughtful stories from the Great Wars. And a reminder at the animal cost of life alongside the tremendous human cost of life during those conflicts. I found out this year that you can actually wear a purple poppy in addition to your red one, as a way to remember those animal lives lost in addition to human lives. And I know that the question of poppies and the color of poppies can be controversial. I, for one, will always wear my red poppy and always support Canadian troops as individuals, regardless of how I feel about war versus peace. So I think it can be controversial to wear a white poppy or a purple poppy versus a red poppy, but I think to wear purple and red side by side is a really symbolic and lovely gesture. And of course, if you're in Ottawa, as I know so many of my listeners are, there is a monument, a memorial to those animals who served in all Canadian conflicts in Confederation Park in downtown Ottawa. It's a really beautiful monument, bronze monument, with a very realistic canine wearing a sort of a bulletproof vest with horse prints, dog and cat prints, and even little bird prints sort of in in relief in the bronze on the ground of the monument. 
it's really lovely and it's worth checking out if you are in Ottawa currently or ever out that way. So before I conclude this episode, I wanted to take a moment, and I alluded to this on Twitter last week, I wanted to take a moment at this point in my podcast's history, episode 13, lucky or unlucky number 13, however you think of it, to take a moment to give a shout out to the podcasts who have inspired me to start this journey and who continue to inspire me week to week to tell better stories and to improve my sound and all of those things. So I just wanted to take a quick moment, if you'll bear with me, to give a little shout out and a little 30 second review about a few of the podcasts that have informed and inspired this podcast and have inspired me as a podcaster, although it's not like I'm suddenly introducing myself as Michelle Nelson podcaster, but I guess that's what I am. So first and foremost, I wanted to give a shout out to a podcast called And That's Why We Drink, which is probably the first paranormal podcast that I ever listened to. And it's hosted by these two amazing hosts, Christine and M. They're based out of California. And from week to week, well, Christine drinks wine, more often than not, and M drinks milkshakes. They recount one paranormal story and one murder story. M talks about the paranormal, Christine talks about murder. And their friendship is so genuine, and their back-and-forth banter is so off the cuff and unscripted. It's just an absolute delight to listen to. I know that some people have really strong opinions about banter in podcasts and are strictly against it, but their friendship is legitimate and their episodes, in addition to providing really spooky, interesting, and historical content, it's that back and forth of theirs that makes the podcast such a pleasure to listen to. So when I started Are You Afraid of the Bark, I initially had a co-host, and my hope was that we could have that same back and forth that was so fun to listen to as a third party. Unfortunately, we didn't quite mesh creatively, but down the road, if I could find a person like that to be the M to my Christine, I think that that would be an ideal scenario. So next up, I wanted to mention another paranormal podcast, Paranormal and horror podcasts are, without a doubt, my favorite to listen to. And that podcast is called Knock Once for Yes. So this is a podcast hosted by Lil and Fitz, and they are British. And each of them has the, just the most amazing, A, British accent, which I could listen to all day long, and B, storytelling style with like, the perfect amount of pause and gravitas and humor. Their stories, which come from their own paranormal experiences and the experiences submitted by their listeners, their stories are true, just ghost stories, the kind that you would want to hear around the campfire. They're excellent storytellers. Their sound quality and music and tone It's just, it makes for such a great listen, and that podcast never fails to give me the super chills. And I've actually been, through Facebook, I've been able to connect with Fitz, and he actually gave me some great advice about the editing of this podcast. I... (laughs) I don't know if he hears any difference, but I feel like I'm slowly getting better at editing and improving the quality of the sound of each episode, so I appreciate him taking the time to explain some things to me, and I just wanted to thank that podcast and recommend that you go have a listen, because it's such a pleasure. It's the kind of thing that pairs perfectly with a cup of tea and a dark, stormy night. So next up is not a paranormal podcast, but a horror podcast. It's called, and I think that this is such a fantastic and macabre name, it's called I Hope You Suffer, and it's hosted by Nathan and Kit, 
And basically the premise is that with every episode, they watch a horror movie and then shoot the shit about it. They talk about it. But the horror movies that they watch are not like the critically acclaimed, like, classics, <laughs> but are really terrible horror movies. So my favorite episode so far was where they discussed a movie called... Oh my god, I think I blocked it out because it had so many scientific inaccuracies. It's called Bait, and I just had to look that up on Google, and I literally typed in movie with shark in grocery store. So that should tell you something about that movie. Sorry, it's called Bait 3D. It's an Australian movie, and they review kind of that caliber of B-grade horror movie. Their back and forth is really funny. Their knowledge of movies and horror movies in general is really extensive, and it's really funny to hear them talk about these particular horror movies, which are more often than not outlandish, don't make a lot of sense, and are just a lot of fun to sort of lampoon. So... I uh, told them that if they ever decide to watch another terrible shark-themed horror movie, that I would love to be a guest sort of reviewer or commentator on that movie, because Bait is essentially about a shark. So there's like a hurricane or something, and water floods into this Australian town, and these great white sharks find their way into a grocery store where these teenagers are trapped and escaping or trying to escape or outlive these sharks or something. And the way in which I first got to talking with Nathan and Kit was to basically tell them that there were about a hundred things wrong with that premise as someone who works with sharks every day. Anyway, they, they're, they're a lot of fun and they're super knowledgeable and they retweet and like everything that I put out on Twitter. So I wanted to give them a shout out and to encourage you to go listen to their podcast and to just give back some of the love that they've given to me. And then the last kind of podcast that I wanted to give a shout out to was one that is newer for me. It's called Lend Me Your Eerie, which is just another great title. Listen, as somebody who thought long and hard about her podcast title and wanted to make it pithy and funny and memorable, I appreciate these clever podcast titles. I feel like these are my podcast brethren. So Lend Me Your Eerie is basically hosted by Brooke and Brittany, and they are from Toronto. So shout out to Toronto podcasters, and they tell scary stories, and Again, they're both, I'm not 100% sure of their background, their respective backgrounds, but they're both just really good storytellers. And I love, I love and am envious of these podcasts that have that great back and forth between two hosts, that great kind of pithy back and forth, able to react to one another's stories, kind of able to riff off of one another have this have this great back and forth banter between stories very envious because they also have that dynamic and it's a joy to listen to and they choose great stories they choose chilling stories and they're both good vocal performers like it's a pleasure to listen to so i wanted to give a shout out to that podcast as well, which is a newer one for me, but that I'm really enjoying. I just have to make my way through their backlog of episodes. They've got, I think, something like like 30, so I need to make my way binge listen to the rest of those, because that is my podcast listening style. And Brooke and Brittany, Toronto podcasters, maybe one day we can, we can meet, I don't know, and share scary stories. So that was my little shout out to just some of the other podcasts that I listen to and that have been really inspiring to me. I hope that you'll go out and give them a listen and see if they're your kind of thing. I do recommend all four earnestly and heartily. So let me know if you have a listen and if you like them and if I could be the one to add another podcast to your weekly lineup, all the better because I think in this community, this ever-growing community of creators. It's just great 
to, to share the love. I, I don't want to keep all of you just to myself, as long as you promise me that you don't replace listening to this podcast with theirs, because that would really hurt my feelings. So that brings me to the end of this episode 13 of Are You Afraid of the Bark? I hope that you had a moment to pause and remember on Remembrance Day, and I hope that the next time the question of like the loss of life uh, in war and conflict comes up, that you also take a moment to thank and remember all of the horses and pigeons and cats and dogs and glowworms who also have given their lives in service of this country. So there you have it, this very special episode 13, this special Remembrance Day episode. Really, really had a good time researching this one. So as always, if you have any questions or concerns or comments, you can reach me in a number of ways at afraidofthebarkpodcast at gmail.com. On Facebook, it's AYAOTV Podcast. On Instagram, it's Afraid of the Bark Podcast. And on Twitter, it's at Afraid of the Bark. Let me know what you thought about these stories this week. Let me know what you think about those other podcasts. If you have a listen on my recommendation, let me know what topics you'd like me to cover moving forward. What kinds of topics, if there's a particular haunting you want covered, or a broader topic of animals, death, the afterlife, so many things that could be covered from week to week on this podcast. And if you have an opinion about what those topics should be, let me know, and I'm open to your suggestions. As always, I'll ask that if you have not reviewed this podcast on Apple Podcasts, that you consider stopping right now and doing that. I know that it's a little bit cumbersome for people who aren't using iOS, but those reviews make a big difference to me and to how many people sort of are able to access this podcast when they're looking up certain keywords. So thank you very much for joining me again. It's always a pleasure. I look forward to having you back with me again this time next week. And as always, I'll finish this episode by simply hoping that you have sweet dreams tonight. (laughs) 